Good evening, campers. It's me, Kieran. 16 years people have waited for Cormac McCarthy's next book, and he graced people with a duology. I suppose Cormac McCarthy decided to take that break just to, just to think about his actions of writing just a terrible book. Grabbing their Stetsons and putting on their cowboy boots, Cormac McCarthy stands were going wild, elated, enthusiastic to get their hands on the Passenger. For this duology, there is Stella Maris, but I want to let people know in reviewing this, I've not even opened this. I have a really interesting relationship with McCarthy because one of my favourite films is No Country for Old Men, and I've still not read the novel. Maybe the book is nothing like the film, but I trust the Coen brothers enough to give a faithful adaptation. Everything about No Country for Old Men captivates me, yet I have read Blood Meridian, and I have read The Road, and have not understood what people like about Cormac McCarthy. But, but I'm interested because there are people who are so enamoured, who are so captivated by him, that I, I want a piece of that. Cormac McCarthy stereotypically writes westerns, cowboys, people in the south. He likes to explore that area of America. However, The Passenger is spread across America, and equally, Cormac McCarthy is writing about now. He is writing about the modern age. There's deviation, just like the road from his usual patter. This is not a Western. And the main character, let me double check his name. Oh, yes. Bobby Weston! Why, Cormac McCarthy? Why do you do this? Let's leave Mr. Weston for a little bit, because he's actually not the first character that we meet. Picture this in your head, because it's one of the greatest images that you will ever encounter. Imagine the most hardcore Cormac McCarthy fanboy. But in The Passenger, a book that they have waited 16 years to read, although he's most likely in his, like, mid-twenties, so hasn't had to wait that long. His entire personality is saying the Blood Meridian is the great American novel and maybe you should read Moby Day. <laughs> At sunset he strips naked, <laughs> naked like Judge Holden and goes, yes boys, this is literally me. <laughs> No, I'm enjoying myself here, and is met with the character, the kid, just a frothing of the mouth like a rabies infected toddler. Oh, imagine it. Alas, this is not the nameless protagonist from Blood Meridian. This is the flamidolite. The middle, the middlemite. I can't say that word. This is the flamidomide kid. With flippers instead of arms, he has a ruckus and caucus troop who engages with Bobby Weston's sister, Alyssa or Alice. Alyssa simply is a genius, a prodigy, but she's also an enigma. Although her brain is functioning on a different level, it's working differently to everyone else's. She is suffering with psychosis. Alyssa envisions the kid is the character who she has deep philosophical conversations with. The passenger flits between Bobby and Alyssa with all the italicized chunks being Alyssa's. These sections, I have to say, a wonderfully madcap. And I'm interested to see how Stella Maris takes this forward if I know what the premise of Stella Maris is. I should read the blurb, I'm just not going to. And therefore, the majority of the story is from Bobby Weston's perspective, Alyssa's brother, who is equally a math prodigy, a genius. However, Bobby decided to focus on formula racing. He was an F2 driver. Why are both Bobby and Alyssa geniuses? Well, their father was one of the people who helped create the atomic bomb, who worked on the Manhattan Project, whose passion, dedication, and life work went to end in the lives of hundreds and thousands of Japanese. Bobby Weston seems to only know death. Not only is he the offspring of a man who created one of the worst weapons known to man, but also his sister has killed herself. He misses his sister. He grieves for his sister because, because he loved her. He, he still loves her. Although Cormac McCarthy doesn't explicitly tell us, it, it, it seems incestuous. All the people who Bobby wines and dines with seems to hint towards the understanding. The modus operandi of Cormac McCarthy's The Passenger is whining and dining. The Passenger is swathes of pure dialogue. Bobby is just simply moving through America. Is he on the run? Well, let's talk about that. Bobby dotted on his dive suit, goes down to see a plane wreckage and one passenger from a plane crash has gone missing and the black box has gone missing. Bobby who returns to his house is met with agents who question him about the missing 
passenger and Bobby knows his stuff. He goes, well, if there was an extra passenger, then according to the FAA laws, there would have to be a stewardess. And the agents go, so where was the stewardess? And Bobby's going, well, there wasn't. He's curious about the passenger, but he doesn't dwell on the fact. It's not really the driving force of this novel. In fact, how this is marketed, you would think that it would be like no country for old men. It's not. This is a missing person who we don't know anything about, so why do we care? Bobby doesn't seem to care. In fact, I would point towards Alyssa being the passenger. Not in a literal way, but in a metaphorical way. Bobby cares about Alyssa because he has a relationship with her. Everyone else who talks about Alyssa sees her definitely as part of Bobby's life, but not as a piece of Bobby's life. That would be my argument, but I feel as though the semantic differences between those two weigh differently. Bobby, who doesn't have a definitive, he doesn't really have closure to why Alyssa decided to take her own life, is left, he's left with the weight on the shoulders that he can't seem to shift, but it's because he doesn't know how much it weighs on him. Akin to when Bobby dives down to check out the plane crash, he's almost floating around death. There's a striking resemblance that I noticed that McCarthy is drawing in his thesis of the passenger, and he's actually referring to another McCarthy, who is actually one of my favorite authors, Tom McCarthy, who highlighted in his manifesto of the International Necronaut Society that there is beauty in death and it is to sing about death. It is the purpose of the Necronauts to explore death in all capacities, in all media. The passenger asks questions, it probes into what is death. In doing so, and not like a Gregory Benford way, and I'll leave my review of Timescape down below, navigates this question through quantum physics. Robert McCarthy is not a scientist, however, he did move to Santa Fe to move towards the Santa Fe Institute. So he has been in conversation with people who know this stuff about this. People often misconstrue the purpose of science in providing answers, and indeed science can provide answers, but you don't just get the answer that you want. You have to conjecture, you have to question, you have to theorise what could happen. Pod observing your subject, you deduce the likely answer. And again, we have those semantic differences. You provide an answer, not the answer. Maybe he does with Stella Maris, but in regards to the passenger, Cormac McCarthy does not provide us any answers. Because how do you give the answer to God? to death, to loneliness, to grief. Those questions are so big that there is not a simple, straightforward answer. Indeed, if Cormac McCarthy did just decide to give us the answer of, is there a God, yes or no, or what happens when you die, I, I, I think a lot of people would have to applaud him. In fact, are we obfuscating the optics? Are these big questions a piece of our life rather than a part of our life. So far I have not enjoyed McCarthy's work, but I have to say, halfway through, the penny dropped, and all of Cormac McCarthy's really annoying idiosyncrasies and, and his little quirks that he feels as though he could do, they clicked. I think it asks the right questions and it's not willing to provide answers, which I, I appreciate Cormac McCarthy not trying to do that at all. I really enjoyed The Passenger. I will say that the fact that Cormac McCarthy is pushing into his 90s and, and can come up with something like this is really refreshing. It was like when I read Treacle Walker by Alan Garner. I'll leave my review for that down below. I thoroughly enjoyed Treacle Walker, but again, that asks a lot of questions and provides no answers. But Garner is pushing into his 90s as well. I have become the person who I vowed not to be. I think I like Cormac McCarthy. Uh, do you know what? I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. I am pleasantly surprised. I'm really eager, now that I filmed this review, to now go and read Stella Maris. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, do you know what? I, I will mention this now. L look at me. Look at me go. I finally got it from the library. Uh, the Border Trilogy. I've got Because everyone says all the pretty horses, and especially the crossing, is like peak brilliance from Cormac McCarthy. And now, I'm actually looking forward to reading over a thousand pages. I, I mean, it's three books, so it's like 300 pages. But if I say a thousand pages, it sounds like way more impressive, doesn't it?